Okay, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful Wednesday, July 4th of 2020. On behalf of Old Dominion University, welcome to Regis, remote experience for young engineers and scientists. My name is Nestor Escovales, and I am a senior lecturer in the engineering technology department here at Old Dominion University. Today, I will be serving as the moderator for the, for the engineering session titled, What is Computational Modeling and Simulation? I am positive you will find this talk very interesting. The presenter for this session is Dr. Oh. Mitchell Odette, who is an associate professor in the Department of Computational Modeling and Simulation at Old Dominion University. Dr. Odette received a PhD in biomedical engineering from McHill University and Master of Science and Bachelor of Science degrees in electrical engineering. Dr. Odette is currently the graduate program director of the Biomedical Engineering Institute at Old Dominion University. Dr. Odette's research interests span simulation and planning of neurological and orthopedic surgery fall detection and injury mitigation for geriatrics and surgical robotics potentiation. We will start in a few seconds with the presentation in around 12.40 p.m. We will switch to questions from the audience. Feel completely free to start sending your questions over as you listen to the talk. Dr. Odets will answer to as many questions as possible in the last part of our segment. Without further ado, here is Dr. Michel Odette. Thanks. So uh, the title of this talk is, what is computational modeling and simulation? And in part, this is an introduction to what it is that we do within my department at Old Dominion University, this being the computational modeling simulation engineering department and at OD, uh, ODU. So we're gonna to touch on a number of applications of modeling and simulation, which I'm going to refer to quite often as simply as M and S. And as you can see, um, we can apply this in a number of different areas uh, that are complementary to each other, including engineering design, uh, exploring what if questions in sciences, exploiting modeling and simulation also from a training standpoint to produce better doctors or better soldiers, and then turning around and using this knowledge in order to put together uh, computer games that are more interesting and challenging to, uh, to users. So let me start by giving you a 10,000 foot view of how we might use modeling and simulation from an engineering standpoint. Typically we come up with some sort of an idea or a concept that, that serves as the foundation for a design. And starting from the concept itself, we can't really uh, implement it on a computer unless we find a way to transpose it to a, what we call a model that itself is conducive to, to a computer implementation. So this model, depending on what it is that we're trying to simulate, can encompass either some sort of algorithmic approach or it can be a mathematical set of expressions such as what you see depicted below, particularly in conjunction with this quadcopter design that we are uh, centering our attention on right now. And so um, that then allows us to produce a computer implementation that we call the simulation. And you might ask the question then, are we done? And typically the, the answer that we come up with when we look at the implementation the first time, there may be some bugs or there may be some inadequacies that we find in the, the verification and validation stage which motivates us then to return to our concept or original idea and perhaps refine the model once more in an iterative fashion so that finally we do have something akin to uh, the physical system that we're trying to emulate. 
And so typically that leads to a simulation that consists in uh, software. Um, so typically computer code that may look like what you see where I'm hovering the mouse right now, which in self, which itself uh, encapsulates the mathematical expressions uh, that I referred to briefly in the previous slide. Once you have a computer implementation, then typically in, a, in an application like this, you have a reproductive simulation that um, produces the improved result. You can see that we have a quad cluster model that interactively relates to the static and all of these models. We don't understand the new static yet, but we have to know the future. And we found that the club up in the reaction and then we get the spectrum, that's one of the spectrum that we have here. Like I found that, that if I look at the graph, I found that it's a very good reason. I need to leave it and take the now. Technically, we want to keep this within 30 minutes. So this gives you a, a foretaste of what we can do. Uh, with the modeling and simulation approach to, to engineering. Now we can also further re uh, refine this approach or reapply it in a completely different context, which is that of the sciences. And if those of you who are interested in sciences know that in general with sciences, we're interested in refining some sort of a hypothesis that governs a natural phenomena that we're interested in. So in this case, we are going to start off with a hypothesis that typically correlates, uh, um, in, in, correlates with observations of, of nature um, that we've come across and that we may have pre-compiled somehow. And so far, this is consistent with the scientific approach in general. And what's new about, about uh, the contribution of MNS in this area is that we might use these observations to motivate a, a model that itself is conducive to a computer implementation. And so this is where we take a, a slightly different approach to, to, to the scientific method than is classically the case. In this case, we have a model that can then lead to a computer simulation. It can be a, um, a molecule or a protein as depicted here, but it could also be some, some other area of science altogether but, but where again, we have a model that is represented by a series of, of mathematical expressions, typically. These mathematical expressions tend to be, let's say, differential equations or some, some form of calculus. Uh, and in general, a, a set of equations that are continuous. And so we have to represent them in terms of bite-sized, discretized uh, uh, mathematical expressions that a computer can can internalize and then used for, for a simulation. And what's cool about this whole approach is that we can exploit this framework to get the computer to enable some what if questions that the uh, scientists didn't think about at first, but seem to evolve organically as a result of the computer simulation. So one example of this type of modeling, mathematical modeling of a physical phenomenon um, is the Cauchy-Poisson expressions that are seen here that govern the, the um, dynamic behavior of fluids, especially in conjunction with some sort of a shock that, that occurs at the bottom of the seafloor that could trigger a tsunami uh, model and therefore lead to a computer simulation of a tsunami. And uh, Sure enough, some people um, in the related scientific areas have seen fit to, to do exactly that and to, to model uh, the, what happens in a, the event of a simulated tsunami on the West Coast. Of course, on the East Coast, we're a little bit less concerned with this because we're not as, uh, pr as proximate to, to um, areas of of such shocks, and namely earthquakes, that you typically find um, close to so ridge lines between uh, geotectonic uh, tectonic plates, rather. 
And so this is, of course, much more relevant to people living on the West Coast, and they have to use these simulations in order to anticipate what can happen as a result. So those are, I give you the foretaste to two main applications now. We can also look at what this does for training. And in particular, this resonates strongly with the medical community, which is often confronted with the fact that medical students have more and more to learn in order to get through medical school and particularly their residency. Um, and yet they, they were expected to do this in the same amount of time that, that other doctors did it um, 30 or 40 years ago when they had a little bit less to learn. And so now there's certainly a clinical interest in using virtual reality based as well as mannequin based medical training. And one of the things that we're interested in pursuing at Old Dominion is in fact combining the two using virtual reality in conjunction with mannequin based training. So one of the uh, main areas here then is to use this type of training in order to evaluate the current performance of the, the medical resident and perhaps use it in, in, to have them uh, improve their practice and gradually get better before they even uh, perform with with uh, real patients. If you think about it, um, you probably don't want to be the first patient that let's say a brain surgeon does a surgery on uh, prior to, to having practiced a particular procedure well ahead of time. And so this may, may offer some, some clues in how the medical community can actually do this in a manner that minimizes the risk to patients. This, um, animation, in fact, shows you the use of a, um, a surgery simulator that is used to, to simulate a, and train, in fact, a stitching process for abdominal surgery. And what's cool about this is you can see that, that there are two instruments being used here. And if I were to ask you to write a computer program uh, that, that involves a certain level of interaction, on the part of the user, you would think, let's write this program for a mouse. Uh, but of course, a mouse can only work in, in two dimensions. And as you can see, this, the surgeon here in training is interacting with this in 3D. So it turns out that we have the three-dimensional equivalent of a mouse called a haptic device. And there are some haptic device manufacturers that can also manufacture a set of haptic devices that, that can be used for both hands at once. So what's called a bimanual haptic device, where the workspace of, of the two haptic devices um, share the same workspace volumetrically. So not surprisingly then, it's possible to have the two virtual instruments here involved in tying a knot uh, in a manner that reproduces uh, a real procedure and in a manner that, that requires the work of, of both hands. Um, I'm going to return to medical simulation in a minute, but I also want to give you uh, a foretaste of what we can do with gaming as well. And with gaming, quite often we're interested in taking physical expressions that govern how things behave in real life. A simple example of this, and typically we want to simplify this so that a computer can, can reproduce it uh, in a manner that cuts corners a bit so that we can reproduce it in real time. So one of the things that we can do if we're interested in reproducing cloth, shall, shall we say, so let's say we want to have a, a human um, um, actor within a game that, that is obviously is not naked, but wearing clothes, and we want the clothes and maybe the hair on this person to behave in a physically realistic manner. So one way in which we can do this is to represent the cloth simply as a collection of point masses um, that are positioned at first in some sort of a plane. Um, and then we might have this plane in fact become curved so that it actually has the shape of the clothing. And then these different masses that, that, that comprise the clothing are linked by springs. And so this collection of masses linked by springs is what allows us, in fact, to, to read this video presents the results for our entirely data driven approach. 
talk at people animation. in the gaming industry Please know that all the video you see physics. here has been captured I've in thought about time. this and have used the this type of by this character has 29,000 clock model based on being interactively driven by the game collection at 60 frames per second actually simulate we do this by pre-computing over 9,000 frames of uh, clock simulation something that is we first build a standard motion graph that recorded that human motion some of which of is shown it, here. It presupposes also we then the clothing, clothing for each of these clips. Humanoid uh, that behaves. Unfortunately, really just storing a single cloth configuration the for moves. each pose but that's yields a poor results entirely with that jumpy transitions. Be carried out by some of the colleagues of the person handling the cloth simulation. So you have the cloth simulation expert here that is making sure that whatever trying to blend out these clothing is being worn as a humanoid. The motion is clearly not in a physical. physically realistic manner. For example, notice how yeah, the hood starts that to fall off, but then is not physically pulled back onto the head. Keep in with this because the clothing behaves in we can visualize the cloth data as this so tree like those structure. Those of you who have an interest in paths in down the tree, thing, this video can, in fact, um, specialize in, in a manner that has applications to gaming. So we also teach in our department the kind of computer visualization techniques that would go into this type of clock model. Now, if I want to circle back to some of these more broader applications, if I go back to science, I really left out the part that gives you a sense of how broad science can be and how, how broad science modeling and simulation can be. NASA knows about this and NASA has, has applied this type of expertise uh, to modeling the type of science that we need in order to, to replicate the activity of, let's say, a, a rover that would typically travel to Mars and then land finally on Mars um, in a manner where we can actually reproduce the robotics that are, that are needed in order to, for this, this lander to land safely and then um, move autonomously within within the Martian surface. So this is certainly uh, a high level um, and, and very important application as far as, as um, spatial exploration. On, on the bottom um, picture of the, the bottom picture of my slide here is actually one of the oldest uh, examples of uh, scientific applications. This is what's called the finite element method. And typically this is where we take a, a design on a computer and where we break, especially if it's, let's say a volumetric object and where we can break down this volumetric object in terms of a few elements. And within a volume, of course, these elements would form uh, a, a collection of tetrahedra or possibly brick-like elements called hexahedra. And the whole point is we, if we understand how stress and strain behave on a simple element like a tetrahedron or a brick-like uh, hexahedron, then we can extrapolate um, or rather interpolate on the basis of a series of, or a collection of, of individual solutions in a manner that allows us to understand what goes, what goes on over a more complex element that is composed of these simpler ones. So this is what's called a finite elements uh, approach to, to um, continuum mechanics. On the right, you can also see that we've uh, also applied this uh, historically to understand how aircraft flies and really how to build a better jet fighter, for example, to understand uh, in particular the type of air turbulence that goes on around a particular wing design. And at the bottom right is, is also a fairly mature example that really dates back probably 30 or 40 years and was, was used um, back in the day and, and still now on, in um, circuit design in order to understand if I have a certain circuit design, is it likely to, to have the, the digital behavior that I expect it to, or is it likely to, to have, let's say, races between uh, a pair of gates that, that causes a dysfunctional circuit. And so something like SPICE then back in the day was uh, one of the first implementations of modeling and simulation as it, as it applied to, 
to uh, engineering uh, circuit design. So the next slide is the one that's really closest to my heart and closest to my area of activity in the sense that we can use modeling and simulation in order to better train medical doctors in order to ramp up their expertise quickly so that when it comes time to, to um, carry their practice to, to a patient, whether that patient is in, in um, the room of a family physician or in the operating room um, waiting to have a, a brain tumor uh, excised from the brain, it certainly helps to have uh, a certain level of expertise um, that was acquired on the basis of either virtual reality simulation or, or mannequins. So on the left is an example of a heart model. And this heart model, in fact, as you can see, is, is beating. And this probably reflects what, uh, what we view to be a generic beating heart model where in particular the depolarization uh, that causes an electrical current to, to travel within, within the special type of, of muscle fiber. So the heart muscle is quite different from the rest, of the rest of the muscle fibers that we find everywhere else on the human body and has the ability to, to react mechanically to this, this uh, uh, flowing uh, electrical conduction that is the result of certain electrical fibers called the Purkinje fibers present in the heart. And so it, what's particular about the heart then is this coupling between uh, the electrical activation and, and the mechanical contraction that you can see. And so the mechanical contraction is what is behind the type of, of blood pumping that, that uh, keeps the rest of the human body irrigated with fresh blood. So this is, this is important in a generic sense, but it can also be personalized on the basis of special types of MRI that we might acquire from a patient. There's this type of MRI called gated MRI that actually provides us with the dynamical behavior of a patient. And there are some research groups worldwide that are trying to, to combine this type of tag, tagged cardiac MRI with the type of generic model that you see, you see there. On the bottom left is an example of a mannequin type of training. And this is in fact, my, my uh, supervisor at uh, Old Dominion, the chair of the department, Rick McKenzie, who has used th this type of mannequin along with computer programs that can simulate the sound of a beating heart so that we can tr uh, train doctors in order to, to use the stethoscope properly to, to improve their diagnosis skills with a stethoscope. On the top right is a simplified musculoskeletal model of, you probably guessed what it, what it is in fact, this is a kind of simplified model of the right hand with a, a model of the hand and the, and the forearm that gives you a, a picture of the dynamic motion of, of uh, the components of the hand. And this too can in fact can be personalized depending on um, the, a volumetric scan of, of the patient's arm, for example. So we could actually take this generic musculoskeletal model and personalize it as well. And then the bottom right image is the kind of research that uh, we would like to pursue at Old Dominion that combines a VR or virtual reality a background that is representative of the operating room with a foreground that consists of the patient um, on which the doctor is, is learning to operate or perhaps learning to treat. Um, I think that we've begun doing this in particular with, with uh, Eastern Virginia Medical School and their interest, in fact, in combining the two for, um, for obstetrics uh, training. Now, Another example of, of using MNS from a training standpoint, and one that in fact has been um, emphasized by the Department of Defense for several years now, is the use of MNS for, for getting more out of, out of their modern so soldier. So the role of the modern soldier compared to, let's say, um, Second World War or even Vietnam, uh, certainly, a, compared to the Second World War in particular, is that the role that they have now may involve peacekeeping or dealing with crowds 
uh, much more than was the case previously where all they had to worry about back in the day was, was dealing with adversaries that were fairly straightforward to identify. Now, if they're dealing with crowds, they can't just uh, use their firearms in a wanton fashion. They have to recognize the differences in the behavior that's required of them. And so not surprisingly then, the modern warfinder uses this type of MNS in order to become a more sophisticated soldier capable of making better decisions um, in a world where that is less and less binary um, in, in terms of an us and them type of scenarios. And not surprisingly then, um, we can go beyond training and, and apply modeling and simulation to a variety of areas uh, such as uh, transportation, where increasingly now, particularly if you're the, uh, the taxpayer and you have hard questions uh, for your Congress member or for, for your, your senator, you want to make sure that taxpayer money spent on, on highways is well spent and where we make sure, for example, that spent money uh, goes towards making sure that we have fewer and fewer traffic jams or we have better, let's say, better robustness to, to flooding in the, in the case that a hurricane occurs. So these are all some what if questions that we can, that we can answer if we uh, model what happens by adding an extra lane here and there, let's say within the Hampton Roads area, where we can actually see based on discrete event simulation where we mo model each car on the basis of such events, we could actually view um, what happens with uh, this type of simulation in, um, in terms of uh, traffic flow um, in response to adding a lane here or there. And therefore we could there um, in this manner then answer uh, what if questions about what is the best bang for the taxpayer dollar in this manner. I touched on the fact that we can apply modeling and simulation to sciences, and the, this particular slide gives you a sense of the, the, the sheer uh, range of scales that is possible. So on the one hand, if, if you were um, aware of, of uh, modern uh, activities from a scientific standpoint, you're aware certainly that there's global warming going on, and it may um, certainly be in our interest to be able to model the type of melt, melting processes that, that take place um, at the North and South Poles and actually see what are the implications on a global scale for that type of melting. So it's certainly con uh, conceivable that we might model these, these phenomena uh, in a global sense and actually see what are the implications for water currents uh, at a global scale. And so that really gives you a sense that the, the, the ceiling on the scales can be as, as large as a, a whole planet. And the right portion of this slide also, um, as you can imagine, this is most likely a, a set of molecules interacting with each other in conjunction with a chemical reaction. So that also gives you a glimpse of the smaller end of the scale and, and tells you that from a scientific standpoint, we can also look at very fine scale. Uh, so it's already dawning on you now that we can uh, consider a number of, of different uh, physical processes that, that can map to, let's say, a continuous equation and can then be discretized on a, on a computer. Uh, another type of, of simulation is what we call discrete event simulation, which might be a series of events within a logistical process um, within a plant, for example. And so this turns out to be a way of improving manufacturing, which would enable countries like the US or certainly Mexico as well, if you're, if you're listening, um, to do more with, with the um, the money that the company wants to spend in order to improve its production capacity and be in a better position to compete against, uh, against uh, globally positioned uh, rivals. So this then allows manufacturers to, 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 to be 
uh, more efficient in terms of their use of resources. So these have been sort of the uh, ways to whet, whet your appetite in terms of what we offer as a department. And make no mistake, this is not just fun and games. This is a full-fledged ABET accredited engineering program. Um, and you can see the courses that go into our program. They include a number of courses that relate to making you world-class software engineers, including uh, classes related to computer programming and uh, um, um, uh, Unix systems, um, as well as uh, particular programming classes that relate to um, uh, software architecture in, in a simulation in particular, you can view this sort of as a ham sandwich. So that the two slices of, of bread are on the one hand, the software development that I alluded to up to now at the top end. And then the bottom end is, is a series of, of classes that you would need uh, that relate to sciences, uh, including a number of math, math uh, classes such as differential equations and calculus classes as well as probability and statistics. And so all of this then it surrounds essentially the, the meat that, or the, that uh, uh, consists of the modeling and simulation analysis classes that you need in order to be uh, world-class modeling and simulation engineers. And so this includes classes on discrete event simulation and continuous simulation uh, that I've alluded to briefly um, in a manner that spared you most of the technical details. And then also a, a senior year capstone design class that uh, will span both terms, the fall term and the spring term. So just to give you an idea of what we can do on a capstone design class uh, context, we one of the previous classes uh, that we had um, put together a a um, virtual reality-based augmentation of, of uh, mannequin-based training in conjunction with Eastern Virginia Medical School. And some of the things that, uh, that in fact, a, a couple of capstone groups did included a, a uh, virtual patient monitor, um, such as you see on the, the right portion here, that um, can, be, can convey, in fact, the, the uh, vital signs of the patient. And then a, an intravenous pump monitor as well that um, also could, could be used in a very realistic fashion um, with, with students uh, also interacting with, with the mannequin as you, as you can see here. So one of the main themes in fact that we're interested in from a medical standpoint within my department is combining the best of what mannequins and virtual reality have to offer in terms of the flexibility of of uh, virtual reality in, in, in producing anything that we can, can implement on a computer. And then the proprioceptive skills that we get from interacting with a physical mannequin. And then briefly before I, I conclude, I just want to touch on um, some of the students that uh, we've, we've had in the past. One of the students in particular who graduated uh, a year ago is Christine Odenwald, and she had uh, success both as an intern at NASA during her sophomore and junior years. And then she, as I mentioned, she finished uh, just slightly over a year ago while also minoring in computer science. She's had a number of scholarships uh, given to her and now has, when she graduated, actually she fielded several job offers and in fact had to a tough time choosing the one that best suited her. I'm hoping that someday we'll find her um, back as a graduate student and uh, in a position to uh, contribute um, from a research standpoint because she's, she's extremely talented. And I, I'm sure that there are many of you that have similar profiles who are listening now who would be in a similar position to intern at NASA as well as contribute in the same way. So briefly before I, I want to uh, conclude, I'm also going to leave you with uh, an overview of some of the companies that have a keen interest in hiring our graduates and in general modeling and simulation graduates. And our program is the only one that offers modeling and simulation at the undergraduate level. And so typically if you want, we're going to work in modeling and simulation capacity, 
within these, these companies that span uh, energy domains, automotive manufacturing, gaming, aerospace, so on and so forth, and certainly medical as far as um, my interests are concerned. So it's clear then that you, uh, these companies would have an interest in this background. And in general, you would need to do a master's or possibly a doctorate. And otherwise, our program is the only program that offers this type of expertise at the undergraduate level within the US and possibly worldwide still at this point. So let me conclude then and, and offer you the summary of what I've um, provided you up to now. I wanted to give you the 10,000 foot view of what we can do in modeling and simulation and also introduce you what it is that we offer within my engineering department. Broadly speaking, it's, under, it's important to understand the, the model as a kind of abstraction of the physical system that serves as a foundation for the computer implementation, which is the simulation. And I'm hoping that this guided tour gave you a sense of the possibilities from medical to transportation to war fighting simulation, and also certainly to broad areas of science. And it's important to, to make the case that one of the reasons that this is so useful to so many companies is that this is the expertise that you need to have in order to help these companies and also yourself uh, explore a number of questions uh, that can otherwise not even be asked, let alone answered on a computer. And this leads to a, a can lead to a better solution in the physical world, such as let's say a better uh, transportation infrastructure, uh, providing better bang for the buck for the taxpayer. So this leads to better transportation, better trained doctors, better soldiers, and so on and so forth. And certainly, from your standpoint, a an extremely compelling and possibly uh, well remunerated career. So at this point. I'm happy to take questions. All right, so apparently I have some questions. Um, so the question, the first question here is at ODU, is biomedical engineering open to an undergraduate student or only as a graduate? If so, what would you suggest studying as an undergraduate in order to focus on biomedical engineering as a graduate? So I will say that uh, we have a minor at the undergraduate level in biomedical engineering. We don't have a bachelor's yet, uh, but eventually I'm hoping to convince ODU a few of us actually, a few professors are hoping to convince ODU to invest more and to offer the, the, the full bachelor's degree. But for the time being, you can do a, an undergraduate degree in, in my department in modeling and simulation with a minor in biomedical engineering. And so that would allow you to acquire expertise in both in, in producing a, a computer program that is a simulation as well as getting the foundation that you need to be a biomedical engineer, such as the physiology and, um, and the uh, mod continuous modeling of, of um, um, organs, for example, or whatever it is, in, in fact, in, in biomedical engineering that, that attracts you. Alternately, you may decide that you may want to do a bachelor's in mechanical engineering or electrical and computer engineering while also doing a minor in biomedical, biomedical engineering. So that possibility is also available to you. Uh, but of course, I'm biased and I would certainly argue in favor of doing the, the bachelor's in modeling and simulation with the minor in, in biomedical engineering. I think that that's uh, an extremely compelling combination and, and for some, companies out there that have an interest in um, this, this uh, combination of expertise in the candidate, there will be very few of you being interviewed for, for that type of position. And so uh, it puts you in a very strong position in terms of getting a job in this particular area. So let's see if the, all right. So there's another question now from greetings from 
from Mexico. Can this simulation help the people who do professional exercise for them to improve their physical skills? So this is certainly the part that I left out, but I, I, if you remember the slide that I had before that had the musculoskeletal simulation of the right hand and the right forearm. And so I made the point there that, that this forearm um, was a generic model and it, that the biomechanics, the interactive biomechanics is simulated on the basis of uh, by me, uh, musculoskeletal simulation software that is available for free. In fact, Stanford University produced the software called OpenSim. And if I if I remember correctly, this uh, animation was implemented with OpenSim. So what's possible with OpenSim also is to personalize it. So I could say I'm going to take either a magnetic resonance image of of someone that is whole body to get a volumetric representation of of an athlete, shall we say, or I might take a laser range sensor and just get the outer surface of that athlete and then try to fit that musculoskeletal model um, to that, to that uh, athlete's 3D surface or MRI volume. And so if I do that, I can come up with a model of the skeleton and of the muscles that is an accurate representation of that athlete. And then I can also take special landmarks and glue them to the athlete's limbs. Let's say that the athlete um, is going to be um, scanned while, while doing a 100-meter dash or playing tennis or something like that. So with the, the right type of, of um, pose acquisition of, of that athlete, then I could not only model the the anatomy of the athlete accurately, but I could also model the dynamic behavior of that athlete accurately as well. Some of these techniques are actually used in Hollywood in order to, to do an animation. If you go back and watch um, Lord of the Rings, for example, so some of the characters in Lord of the Rings were, were represented with this type of, of pose acquisition on the basis of these actors. So we don't have to do this just for actors. We can do it for athletes as well, and then animate the the uh, biomechanical model of uh, of the skeleton and the muscles for that athlete, and then look at another animation from another athlete that might be even better at their particular area of activity, and show the first athlete. Well, look, the, um, the world number one world ranked let's say tennis player or, or golfer or swimmer is doing these things slightly differently from you. And so you might wanna concentrate based on the biomechanics um, measurements that we're able to get from a computer on the basis of the comparison of how you behave with that athlete with how this, this number one ranked athlete uh, also behaves. So it's definitely possible, not only in the same way that Hollywood did this for Lord of the Rings, we could definitely do the same thing um, on a subject-specific basis in order to improve the game of the athletes. Uh, there seems to be another question still. Hi, I have a question about biomedical engineering. If I want to dedicate myself to the development and design of prosthesis and implants for the body, is biomedical engineering a good course of study? So it is, and, and so as I mentioned, Old, Old Dominion does not have biomedical engineering at the undergraduate level um, as a major, but if you wanted to do something like this, you could do a major in mechanical engineering or modeling and simulation engineering, and then take the extra classes for the minor, and then use some of these software tools that I talked about that where instead of having, let's say the full skeleton of um, showing the dynamic behavior of, of that musculoskeletal model, we could actually, because again, with simulation, we can explore some what if questions. So some of these what if questions um, govern what happens if instead of having a full left leg, we actually cut off this, this model's leg from the left knee onwards and replace it with a few different models of prosthetics. And let's say we have two competing models for, for the prosthetics. 
uh, what, what will be the better design. So we could use a, a number of different types of, of biomechanical simulation in a manner that is subject specific as well. So we, could, we can not only do this for the geri uh, uh, generic model that I showed you before, but as I touched on, increasingly now in, in, in research, we're combining medical image analysis with biomechanics and we're, we're saying, all right, we can now personalize the biomechanical simulation and, and ask the question, for this particular patient, who in fact does not have a lower left limb, um, can we uh, look into the computer implementations of the, of the prosthetics designs and in fact uh, come up with the better one as far as this patient is concerned? It could very well be that we, we, we come to the realization that design A is better for subject A and design B may be better for subject B. If subject A is, is uh, a slim woman, for example, then we may want to, to op opt for the prosthetic design that is, that is smaller and lighter. And if, if the patient is an obese uh, man, for example, then we might need a prosthetic design that is larger and, and sturdier. Uh, I have a question still. In the presentation, you show a simulation of a drone flying, but how does it differ from the real world simulation? So the question that I ask here is, what do you mean by real world sim simulation? Real world um, is one thing, and then simulation is something else. Do you mean, I think what you mean is the type of simulation that is used to train pilots. And the type of simulation that is used to train pilots has a, a lot in common, in fact. So the type of simulation that he's used to train pilots, I've I used to work in before I became a biomedical engineer, and it has some of the same mathematical equations for the dynamics of that particular aircraft. So in, in, the, in the case that I showed you, I had the, ex the expressions for the quadcopter, but there's no reason that I might not have the same uh, airplane that Orville and Wilbur Wright uh, had if we were able to reverse engineering that one, or we could replace the propellers with jet engines and actually come up with, with um, the similar equations for a fighter jet. In fact, uh, there, um, in a manner that, that is similar to, to what I talked about with the musculoskeletal simulation, there's also free software for flight simulation as well. It's called Flight Gear. So if you go to flightgear.org, you'll see that you could actually use Flight Gear to simulate any type of aircraft. And that is fully a virtual, virtual reality um, uh, simulation in this case. And it turns out that between virtual reality, which is fully virtual, and so at one end is, for, is virtual reality, which is one pole, shall we say, of the virtual and physical um, uh, spectrum. At the other end is the physical world, and in between there are different levels of virtuality and physicality. So one example that is in the middle there is what we call augmented reality. Augmented reality involves both the physical world in the backdrop and, and the virtual world where we, we synthesize a virtual camera that has the same optics as the original camera that, that captured the physical world. And if we're able to, to uh, de describe the physical camera accurately enough, then we can synthesize the virtual camera that allows us to project a virtual object in the very same uh, way, synthesizing the object of the real camera. So I guess the, the question that was asked before really is, what do we mean by virtual reality? And what do we mean by, by the physical world? And as you can see, it's not a binary situation. It's a spectrum with um, intermediate levels such as augmented reality. Next question is the following. This is a really long one. I see that I've captured your interest. Hello, I use modeling to analyze mechanical structures. The main issue is the capacity of the hardware to do the calculations and throw reliable results. Is it a good idea to simulate the, the entire structure with less information 
to approximate the real result. I understand that depends on the objective of the analysis, but how, how can I define the best threshold of information to obtain the reliable results? So it turns out that, uh, that um, this relates to finite element modeling. And this is often a question that we ask in medical simulation as well. If I want to build a neurosurgery simulator, um, and if, if I look at, at the people who've done finite element modeling of the brain, most of them have, have come up with models of the brain that, that are comprised of over a million tetrahedra. And so you can imagine they've used, essentially represented the brain in terms of very small elements. But really, if I want to interact with this thing with haptic devices in the same way that I showed you before, then I have to have the, most of the brain represented by really large tetrahedra and only have small tetrahedra where, where it's close to the tumor and I really care about, about the effect of the therapy. And so mechanical engineering is like that also, in the sense that mechanical engineers who do finite element uh, modeling, they understand what are the limitations from representing a, a building with a million elements versus representing that same building or a bridge, shall we say, with a thousand elements. They understand that with a, a, a thousand elements instead of a million, they will have a much faster response, but then the, the, this is the trade-off. They will have a little bit less certainty and understanding of, of the type of stress and strain and, and uh, robustness that they can get from the simulation compared to what they were to get um, with the, the, mil, the million element simulation. It also turns out that there are some mechanical engineers who are who are interested in combining the two, what we call multi-grid finite elements. And it turns out that that those who use the coarse level representation in order to get the fine level representation results, they can actually get the fine level more quickly if they start off from a, a coarse level solution. Um, so I hope that answered your question. Um, next question. I just think this is a wonderful dissertation, amazing simulation, Professor. Which software system did you use for the turbulence length scale control simulation? Which important criteria is it uh, necessary to take into account for med medical 3D simulation? These are two very different questions. Um, I, I would have to refer you to the authors of, of the, the um, the simulation that that you mentioned in particular. So I did the turbulence length scale control size simulation. I'm not sure which one you mean exactly, but in general, I've I've attributed them. And if you if you if you email me um, and tell and give me the snapshot of which one, then uh, or describe this this one in greater detail, then I'll answer your question. But the important criteria necessary for medical 3D simulation is an area of expertise of mine. And what it boils down to is the simulation has to make the doctors better. And the way that we decide that the doctor is better or gets better more quickly is based on how well they do with patients. And so in general, the way that medical doctors characterize how, how simulation makes them better is they look at what are the statistics for, for patients in terms of how their outcome improves with doctors who are simulation trained versus doctors who are not simulation trained. trained. And so there are papers out there that, that demonstrate that a cohort of medical residents that have trained on the type of bimanual um, abdominal surgery simulator that I showed you before, versus the other cohort that did not. And all they did really was, was watch the senior surgeon, how the senior did it, and uh, gradually acquired the skill based on observation and, and um, doing things incrementally. It turns out that the simulation cohort outperformed the other cohort on the basis of superior patient outcome, less morbidity and mortality as they, they use it in the literature. So fewer patients who died as a result, fewer patients who had serious problems after the procedure as a result as well. 
Next question is, um, could someone with a physics and math BS go to grad school for computer engineering at an ODU or do they need an en engineering bachelor's degree? Or do you think that you could get a job in the field with physics and math degree? Great lecture, by the way. So thanks for the compliment. And, and certainly physics and math BS is certainly enough, I think, to do a graduate degree in computer engineering or better still in modeling and simulation engineering at Old Dominion. And, and there are many who, who I know, some of them are good friends of mine. One of my good friends did a bachelor's in mathematics and did um, his doctorate in, at McGill with the same advisor that I had, despite the fact that I came from an engineering background and he came from a math background. So definitely physics and math is a tremendous springboard to do anything. Next one, thank you, Professor Odette and the staff at ODU. This present presentation really intrigued me as a student learning to learn more. How would I go about computational modeling and simulation? For example, are there any programs or languages that are commonly used? Thank you. Well, as you can imagine from, from my lecture, it really depends on what you want to apply MMS to because the tool that I use for medical simulation, let's say the, the musculoskeletal simulation is not going to be the same tool that we use for transportation simulation or the same tool that we use for, for warfighter training. So if you were to do a bachelor's with us, uh, the mod computational modeling and simulation engineering at ODU, you would uh, start off by learning the basics of modeling and simulation. And then in their third and fourth year, you would decide what it is in MS that you like the most, and then take a few elective classes in those areas. And then you would typically learn C++, which is the most prevalent high-level language that is used in simulation, that and possibly uh, Python to an extent. But C++ allows you to write computer programs that run faster than, than Python. Uh, and in general, I'm a big advocate of, of open source software tools, and many of them happen to be implemented in C++. A few others are in Python, but if they need to go fast, they tend to be implemented in C++, and some of them are, are written in a manner that exploits um, parallel hardware, and in particular, the graphical processor unit hardware uh, will typically use uh, GPU acceleration libraries that also are written in C++. Um, so I hope that answers your question. This is a kind of different question, but do you think that as time progresses and simulations become more lifelike, this could eventually result in dilemma between distinguishing simulation from reality, or they can be used for negative rather than progressive ways? I think that it's, it's possible. I, um, for one thing, I'm, as I mentioned in one of my answers, there's really a, um, um, a spectrum between virtual reality and the physical world. And so in between you have things like, like augmented reality. And so this may be an example where uh, uh, the, the combination comes close to the physical world. So in general, to, to the practiced eye, it will always be obvious what differences there are. But it's true, though, that it, it is possible to, to trust uh, a simulation too much, which is why one of the areas that we emphasize in our, in our degrees is, is verification and validation. So it's your responsibility as a modeling and simulation engineer to come up with an implementation that is as close as possible to the physical world uh, at least in terms of the abstraction uh, um, that that uh, synthesizes the characteristics of the physical world that you care about. So you may not uh, synthesize every aspect of the physical world because, of course, that's too open-ended for a computer program. But certainly it's possible to do things negatively through, through a lack of, of exercising care. And it's also possible for us to train computer programs too much in general and so it's important sometimes, especially for medical applications, to, to come up with creative ways to, to leave the user in the loop somewhat, give them the right to, to override the system if they need to in, in that situation. 
apparently my time's up. And so I will leave it at that. Thanks for your time.